afternoon, everyone. So we now have another RCGI colloquium, and today we have the honor to host here Professor Spencer Sharing, head of the Department of Aeronautics at the Imperial College London. He is a visiting professor from the SPEC program, uh, and that's one of the activities uh, inside this program. So he's here to uh, do some research with, with the group from Brazil on uh, fuel cells, basically fuel cells modeling, but it's going to talk about uh, um, uh, other stuff that he has been carried out, carrying out uh, at Imperial College uh, London. Uh, he's a specialized uh, in high order finite element methods and particularly their applications to uh, fluid mechanics and heat transfer. So Spencer, please. Thank you. Thank you for the invite and thank you for being here. And so I agreed to talk today on this uh, advancing high fidelity simulations, although Tiago was very keen that I, I deleted one of my keywords, which I'm afraid I'll have to bring up again on spectral HP element methods. I think one of the, uh, uh, the key uh, part of the title here is this advancing. There's two topics that I want to touch on. One is how do we actually take these methods, these, these relatively advanced methods, and translate them into industrial practice. That would kind of be the proper theme. Of course, the subcontext is how long it takes to do each stage of these advancements. It's all very well for us to say, we're magically going to do it, but uh, I think you'll get the impression through the talk that it does take a, a few iterations, a few, few steps to get along there now. Let me just see if I can make this advance. There we go. So, uh, so not to kid away, uh, my, my spectral HP element methods, just so you have some context, as Bruno just mentioned about the spectral HP element methods. Uh, these are high fidelity in the sense we try to put really high accuracy in a, in, a, in a discretization. Here we have an example of the UK being discretized in triangle elements. Within each element, we use a, a polynomial order, which brings much higher accuracy and hopefully allows us to get to this high fidelity type simulation. Now, for those of you that have come across maybe not the spectral HP element method, there's lots of titles we like to use, but we're all part of one family. Classically, the, the finer element method would be called continuous Galerkin, now a technique called discontinuous Galerkin. Uh, there's uh, other similar related ideas called flux reconstruction spectral difference. If you've ever heard one of those, that's part of the same family that I'm going to talk about today. And why do we do this? We do it because there's a cost. Of course, there's a computational cost which scales something like the polynomial order to the fourth power, but the error in theory can go down uh, much faster, exponentially fast. So we refer to things being fast, but that doesn't actually mean that if you take a commercial code and you run it, you will probably see that that runs pretty quickly and we don't run faster than that. The fair measure of speed is if you want the exact answer, if you want something that's very accurate, we can get to that answer quicker. So there's a, a be mindful that I wish we could just press a button, everything would work automatically and it would run on your, your phones. That's not the case. These are tools that are used on the largest computers in the world, but to get to the most challenging problems. Problems. And one of the examples here is shown in this very simple idea that if I have a, a cone, this top image of something going around in a circle, it should remain like a circle. If I use, this is actually more accurate than most commercial software would be, if I take a linear finite element type discretization of that, what we see is the, the cone here smears out quite quickly. That's the numerical diffusion coming into play versus if I use different types of discretizations, of course, of meshes in higher polynomial orders, here's one with polynomial order three, or here's one with polynomial order of eight. After those rotations, I still see something that looks like the original cone. That's what we want. The smallest scales of our problems that might be moving around in space, I'd like to see them at the end of our simulation. And that's why we play with these advanced algorithms trying to, to maintain them. Now, how do we get people to use it? Sorry, I'm going to click on the wrong thing. Well, one way is to make to write some software tools and give it away. <laughs> so this is pretty much our strategy in the Nectar++ code base. Uh, my main uh, focus, I guess, prior to the, the work visiting here, are uh, related to incompressible flows. After fact, when Bruno many years ago did his PhD with me, we used to work on these sort of uh, topics of flow past cylinders. Uh, we also more recently have done a lot of work, and I'm going to touch on this for the compressible flows. Interestingly, these two middle examples might be more relevant to the fuel cell modeling we've been discussing this week. Uh, the biological flows, which I did a lot of uh, in my earlier years of the cardiovascular flows, these are complex tubes that have Reynolds numbers of the order up to 1,000 that we're discovering is the relevant to the fuel cell modeling. And on the right-hand side, this is actually a, a, a reaction diffusion model. It's um, 
uh, on a manifold on a surface that looks like the heart. This represents the electrical signal on your heart that when it sweeps over it, it causes the heart to pump and forces blood flow to go around. So in our more recent cases, maybe we have uh, uh, the, the electrical chemical reactions we want to put on, but those are the iron shadow models they use in those cases. So it kind of highlights that there are, you can take these different technologies and apply them to very different applications. So that's what we've got in tools. Here's a different example of advancing, maybe my advancing gray hair over the years. So this is, this is the length of time it's tended to take me to take, if you like, theory through to application. So uh, some years ago, this, this image on the left-hand side is when I was a PhD student. And for a good decade or so, uh, uh, we had to just sit around, work out the theory, work out the first implementation of these tools, and essentially develop software, which we, you can glibly call PhDware, that maybe I was the only one that knew how to change the code base, and that wasn't very good as a tool that we could distribute and work together on. So it's this second stage that I kind of want to focus on now. So uh, at least 10 years ago, I started a collaboration working with McLaren very closely, and that was the first uh, close industrial application, where we're trying to redesign, understand the key problems about how do we get other people to use it, and more importantly, how do we get industry to adopt these techniques when applicable. And to do that then, oh yeah, so just to remind me that that take at least 25 years, for those of us where there's not so many people without gray hair in this room, but it, that's as long as it can take. It doesn't mean that there's not important steps along the way, but you have to have the willingness to follow it for quite a while to get this, do this sort of translation. So here's the real, really what I want to talk about. We've got academia ourselves on the left-hand side. I've got the high fidelity tools, which are in spectral HP element methods, and I would like to see it used by a general populace, let's call that industry, or on the right-hand side. The steps that I find myself repeatedly doing over the years are the following. Okay, you can't do anything till you make a mesh, so we better worry about these specialized techniques. And I talked about this last year when I visited about how do we make specialized meshes for these problems, and I'll, I've just got one side to explain that. The second stage, which I think is maybe more, a lot more important, is also if we can make a mesh, how do we make sure the user gets an answer? Now, maybe it's not a very good answer, but the user generally prefers to have an answer than just to have a NAN. And the heart of that, and I'm going to allude to some of the techniques, more manual techniques, is bringing robustness and stabilization, but trying to keep those earlier properties I mentioned of the high fidelity accuracy. There's a, those are slightly in conflict. If we're just happy to smear everything, then it could make it very robust, but it can't be accurate. If we want to maintain some of the accuracy, how do we have to be smarter about the, the stabilization we use? If we get it to run and we get an answer, then invariably the question comes up, how do we make it more efficient? How do we make it run faster? Uh, there are two aspects that tend to go on. One is, of course, using advanced uh, uh, computers, GPUs, accelerators. And we're actually going through a whole redesign process uh, at the moment, but I won't allude on that. Another is algorithmically, we can look at more complicated or different algorithms and the implicit solvers is, is the one of the drivers that I think is unlocking some of our, our features that I want to, to, to at least give you an impression of. And the final one I'm going to say is, okay, if we can make our meshes, we can make it stable and maybe we make it as fast as we can, some of the problems we want to solve still won't fit on the largest computers out there. So we then have to be a bit smarter about how we think about discretizing our problems or how we can reduce the scope of our problems. Uh, we have a technique which is known as using a Fourier. If, it, if the geometry was just a 2D example, there's lots of symmetries you can use of the problem to try and get speed up. There's another one I want to talk about here is how we do embedded simulation. Maybe the complex flow isn't complex everywhere. How do I zoom into the bits that are of interest to me and, and what challenges are about trying to do that kind of specialized condition? So that's pretty much what I want to talk to you about today. And I'm going to use both examples from incompressible low speed flow and compressible higher speed flow. So start on this left hand side, meshing and robustness. So this is really isn't my work, it's a lot of my, two of my collaborators, Dave Moxie and Joaquin Piro. Joaquin's a professor in the Department of Aeronautics uh, and Dave Moxie's a professor in uh, King's College London, quite close to us, and they're the ones behind most of this. So for these, these higher fidelity spectral HP element methods, like everyone, we need to start with a CAD definition or something, so you have a boundary representation. Then we follow what we might see as a kind of commercial path of making a, a linear mesh. Now, one of the advantages but challenges of high order meshes is we can now make the surfaces curved again. If we look at this gingerbread man, his mouth and the edges of this, it's all faceted because that's all we uh, can represent it with a low order mesh. 
Uh, it's maybe not so clear at this resolution, but the actual geometry here is curved. So real surfaces, if they're not, they often have smooth curvature, and we can put that feature back into our meshes. So that's a, that's a positive side of our higher order methods and mesh generation. The pain becomes here that if we want, as we often do in fluid mechanics, to represent the regions very near the walls, then we have these boundary layer regions, and it's very easy to have a, a near wall mesh to allow it to be curved and deformed, and for the whole thing to become self-intersecting, which is what this red line represents here. And then it doesn't matter what you do, nothing will run. That's just going to blow up. So this is, this is definitely a problem, step one, that must be chosen. And uh, I guess a, a more exotic way of dealing with this was this animation we saw just at the bottom, which is we can look to see how we can deform the mesh as a, a partial differential equation or, or like a, a structure. Uh, one of the, the, the easier techniques we came up with was, well, let's say we can just build a linear mesh which has really thick boundary layers. We can use the building blocks of classic finer elements, which takes this green prism and it would map it to these, all of these prisms shown on the right hand side. And what we can then do is go back to this simple space and slice it up in any manner that we want. And there's a transformation that allows us to represent these boundary layers of any thickness we like. And that's the technique that we've managed to circumvent to get these more and more interesting geometries and have really close near wall boundaries resolution. So that uh, is a topic I think I talked last time, so I won't dwell on it too much more, but it's this, this stabilizational robustness that we want to bring to these methods. So what are the headaches that we have in solving these problems? Well, I classify them as two. There's wave interaction or aliasing type problems and wave trapping. Uh, aliasing, as uh, comes up in many fields, we have an idea that we resolve some, some length scale, some uh, sine wave here on our mesh. And in our problems of interest, they're nonlinear. So in, in like the incompressible fluid mechanics, they're quadratically nonlinear. These two waves, when you multiply them together, make a higher frequency wave which might not be resolvable on our mesh. And so one of the problems is how do I take that higher frequency information and propagate it or push it back onto the lower frequency mesh? If I do it wrong, I get put too much energy and the thing blows up. If I do it right, then I can at least control this, this sort of instability. And there are three instabilities we worry about in these codes. One comes from the nonlinear terms of the partial differential equations. A second comes from the fact that that uh, last slide, the geometry deformations, when we deform and curve our meshes, we introduce higher frequencies into the geometry of the problem, and that couples back in. So in these two cases, we just have to be smart about how we use our integration rules. And if you mathematically sit down and integrate at a sufficiently high resolution, you can control this error that comes back. I won't dwell too much. There's a, a for the more uh, advanced techniques, these discontinuous Galerkin methods. There's a form of aliasing that comes out with coupling elements to one element to another. But at the end of the day, we can deal with this in a, in a, in a good numerical method of integrating at the right accuracy. So that's our first problem possibly dealt with. The second one gets a, a, a bigger headache. And actual fact, this relates to a, a PhD student of mine from Brazil, Adeta Mora Rodrigo, who helped study this during his PhD more recently with us. If we have a region where the, a wave comes along and it has a mesh expansion, uh, physically, you can think of this as like a light wave propagation hitting a new material. Uh, the expansion mathematically is like saying, I've got a material that has this, uh, very fine resolution moving to a very coarse resolution. And what a wave will do when it hits this boundary is have a reflection and a transmitted wave. Now that's fine if we were, we were studying optics and something, that would be the right physical properties. In fluid mechanics, there should just be one wave that moves from the left to the right. This, this reflective wave should never have existed. It's a numerical artifact of this rapid expansion. And I put these two slides as an example of some earlier meshes where we meshed it fine and we dealt with it near wall de-aliasing. And we had these off-body instabilities which come from this, this reflection. So we have to do something about that if we want to have, where we can afford to have very big meshes and then we want to have the expansion, what can we do to stabilize that? Well, at the end of the day, we, we go back and we do add some form of diffusion to our scheme. The first attempt we had was this thing called spectral vanishing viscosity. Um, and what we can be smart about is how we enter the diffusivity. We don't want the low frequencies of our problem to be touched. Otherwise, we destroy the accuracy that we try to design in the schemes. It's the high frequencies that tend to suffer from these numerical artifacts, and we'd like to decay them. So we can design this, this Q operator here, this diffusion operator that kills off high frequencies. So if we accept that's a reasonable approach, the question is how much diffusion or what do I do? What, how do I, do I model it to? 
Now I've mentioned, I'm afraid I'm not going to describe the full details, but this technique called discontinuous Golurkin methods have these very favorable properties. Now what do these two graphs represent? It's this graph on the left-hand side represents how waves, so, so they uh, propagate from left to right. So I have a high frequency wave and I move forward in time and that wave should remain the same shape and it should ideally move at the right speed, which is this diagonal line on the left-hand side. Now all of these deviations from the right-hand side, this is for different polynomial orders, tell me that waves travel too fast or too slowly in that domain. And so they, they generally cause wiggles in my solution. What's going on on the right-hand side, this is the indication of the diffusion of the problem. So if I have that same wave at some time and I move forward, it should be diffused according to this rate, which is this line from the, the top line here. Now, what's really nice about these discontinuous Galerkin methods is these waves that propagate at the wrong speed also get numerically killed off at the same time. So there's a, a, a good balance in these schemes about, okay, stuff that's not very well resolved or has poor resolution also decays and gets rid of it from our problem. So it's not that we remove it, but, but the adding in the right level of diffusion here makes these schemes more robust. So when we deal with our classic finite element methods, we exactly try to, to mimic that property. There's one important extension that came out of this paper uh, of Rodrigo in 2019, and it's using this idea of a spatial eigenvalue problem. I'd like to share this with you because I didn't really have a physical idea of what it, what it meant before until to, to we solved this problem. So here we take something that's an advection diffusion problem. We solve it using just Fourier away at modes, and you should get this dispersion relationship here. Now, classically, when we teach this problem, we solve this problem by assuming a value of k, which would be a spatial wavelength, and seeing what value of omega you get. In this spatial eigenvalue problem, you say, I assume a value of omega. This is how something oscillates in time. So imagine I have this mesh here, and I've magically got something that's oscillating in time at a, at a wave number of omega. If I solve now this quadratic problem for k, it tells me the waves that propagate to the right and propagate the ones that we don't like, the ones that propagate to the left. So by using spatial eigenvalue analysis, what we've done is we've gone back, taken our finer element schemes, added or designed a, few, a diffusion operator, which then mimicked this discontinuous Galerkin scheme. And, and that seems quite a long protracted way, but what it does is those waves that built up in our mesh and grew and came unstable, we deliberately make sure there's a, a, a larger, reasonable amount of diffusion on those waves as they decay out quickly. And this has allowed us to run all sorts of industrial strength, if you like, parameters like the Reynolds number and get solutions. Um, so that, that was a quite an important breakthrough. And there's been another step, again, motivated by Rodrigo, but this time with a collaborator called Eric Berman, who suggested something else called the gradient jump pe uh, penalty method. So uh, uh, there's a bit of a math term. I won't uh, uh, dwell on that, but I'll give you this example that if I have a linear finite element mesh, if it's not quite resolved between the edges, there's usually a jump in the derivative, a jump in the gradient. What this, this approach suggests you should do is you should calculate that jump and add a penalization term to your scheme. Now, if Eric had just told me that out without doing any of this analysis, I said, well, that's very nice. That's probably a big pain to implement. I'm not sure why I do this. The analysis that I just motivated you from the spectral vanishing viscosity, Rodrigo also did for this scheme. And we discovered with very minimal parameters that we had all the favorable properties that the discontinuous Galerkin method has and these other schemes. So this is why this has become a big interest to me. And what does it show in our schemes? It's less diffusive. Here's an example if we did nothing, if we use the classic fine element method. And if we add this stabilization, you can see you get this much smoother type profile. But on top of that, we have this idea of this robustness. So those unresolved waves are being decayed and don't transmit and, and build up in our solution. So, so this is now our preferred tool, although we're still having to do some redesign of this and uh, uh, um, uh, optimization of it. I should be fair, this is an, as I said, all good ideas. Somebody's uh, thought about it or demonstrated it in the past, and this goes back to 1976, where uh, Douglas and Dupont referred to it as actually the continuous interior penalty method. I've chose, we've chosen to sort of call it jump penalty, so we just realize what it does physically, but, but, but really, if you wanted to look at the literature, that's where you should go back and start. What's it doing? It's penalizing this jump. Uh, for those on the more mathematical side, what it's trying to say is, rather than the solution be a C0 continuous solution, when you penalize that jump, you try to make the solution smoother everywhere. You try to make it continuous at the boundaries. So it's called a, a weak C1 type approximation. And 
Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button again. Ah, uh, yeah, so I won't uh, do those last two techniques. So let's have I show you this example. If we draw this effort, does it make any difference? So here's a, 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 a well-studied problem of flow paths, a, a circular cinder at 3,900. And these are the two schemes I've just described to you. The, the spectral vanishing viscosity that tries to mimic this continuous Glurkin method and this idea of this gradient jump penalization. What you see in this first image, this, this wake seems to go on further, but there are a lot of wiggles further down the bottom here. So this, is, this represents the challenge of you want to damp stuff, but only damp the very minimal amount. And so some wiggles might appear, but that could still give you much more favorable properties. And that's what's shown out by these plots. I'm gonna blow up this middle one in a minute, but what we're gonna do is take profiles through this wake and take the time average and compare it to some, some well-known data. So, I blow this up, the, the two black lines here, if you like the gold standard, they're a very high resolution simulation. And I think some experiments, I don't remember that's experimental computations. So that's what we'd like it to do. And this is what the wake behind the cylinder should look like. If I use this discontinuous Glurkin method, what we see for these uh, certainly polynomial order three, it's pretty diffusive. It's making a set of this kind of square shape in the wake. It makes this more parabolic shape which if we increase the resolution, if I increase it from third order to fifth order, you see I get back some of the squareness. So, so it still converges. But now if I compare it to this gradient jump penalization, that's balancing it better. Already at a polynomial order three, it's almost exactly got the answer. So there's a, it's a bit more expensive to implement, but I'm getting a uh, poly, polynomial order of accuracy, to, uh, a factor of two lower, and getting the right answer by using that stabilization technique. So it gives us a hint of how much there is possibly to extract from these flows if we're smart about it. And so we've been running from some other simulations, more higher Reynolds number simulations. This is an uh, a example that we, we work with with McLaren Racing. It's actually not the whole front wing at the moment. We just do this slice through this, the, this front wing geometry, so these three, set, three aerofoils. And James Slaughter has been using this technique to stabilize and run that simulation. So I hope that gives you an idea of what we had to do to make some meshes and make sure the flow actually runs on there. What about this efficiency question? What do we do to make our schemes run quicker? And I'm gonna focus now on the compressible flow. We are actually interested in some of these techniques for incompressible too. So, so what happens in an incompressible flow? So I want to start to have an implicit algorithm versus an explicit algorithm. And why, why should that be the case? If I'm gonna go back to my favorite 1D model, what do I know from my uh, numerical analysis? Well, if I was to explicitly march in time, I know that the convective speed is dictated by something called the Carag frederick levy condition. So the, the speed of propagation, the velocity here, dictates my time step. And there's also, if I did the diffusion operator explicitly, I would have a restriction which scales as delta x squared divided by the diffusion coefficient. So that's classic finite uh, different methods. For these high order spectral element methods, you can heuristically say, I replace this delta x, I replace it by a different length scale, it's the, the size of the main mesh, but I have to divide it by the polynomial order squared. So what starts looking scary is our time step, well, it's dictated by this polynomial squared, so that could get quite small. And the diffusion operator is scaled by the polynomial order factor of the fourth. So this could be overly restricted time steps, why we might want to do it implicitly. So this is a paper from 2018 where all we were trying to do was study a compressible flow at a Mach number uh, of uh, getting up reasonably high 0 0.87 and 400,000. So it's this little bump in the middle of a flat plate and it has this small recirculation region. And in physical units, the time step was one times 10 to the minus nine. So, okay, I don't know, we can't wait that long for, I mean, it's fine. In non-dimensional, it might have only been one times 10 to the minus seven, but that's still a bit too small to hope to simulate anything. And where did that come from? It came from the fact that there's a, a, a viscous layer that we want that's causing this recirculation near the wall. And uh, what we, so we want to resolve that with mesh. But in, in compressible acoustic methods, you have uh, uh, waves, um, acoustic waves, and the same waves that you're hearing me, that, that kind of then have to move over those very small elements. So if we go back to my estimates and I say, what would be the viscous, the, the viscous uh, time step estimate from the finer difference? It's actually not quite as bad as the time step we observe. It's actually the convective, the CFL uh, uh, time step that dominated this because we have the speed of sound in this as well as the velocity. And I go and calculate over these small elements and I get something back to the small time step. Anyway, at the end of the day, uh, if we want to study high Reynolds numbers flows and incompressible limit, 
it felt to me that we only had a choice of needing to want to go implicit in our solar technology. And so uh, uh, Jing Guo Yan and Yu Pan, two PhD students uh, over the last four or five years, implemented this scheme, the Jacobi Free Newton Krylov, which is used in other fields in finite difference fields. So I've just got a schematic to motivate it a bit here. I won't do too many more details on that. To begin with, we take our, our, our conservation law and we discretize it, okay, using a discontinuous Galerkin method in this case. The important step is here. If I want to solve this problem implicitly, I take this du dt and take a, a backwards difference formula. So I've got u of n plus one here and u of n plus one here. So this is now a, this is a nonlinear term. It's nonlinear implicit because I've got these two terms on both sides. And at every time in my time step, I now have a nonlinear solution to solve if I want to make this problem implicit. So to solve a nonlinear problem, what we always teach in our, our numerical analysis, we've got this thing called the Newton method. In this schematic for this nonlinear term, I'd like to get this dot here. I might have the previous time step. I would take that. I then have to calculate in this scalar case the gradient. In the uh, uh, system case, it would be the Jacobium of that nonlinear term. It essentially takes a time step, sub step that propagates down the direction of that gradient. I get a new gradient and a new gradient until I converge. And it converges uh, to, to pretty rapidly as long as you're in this, this region of attraction. Because we're going to apply it to time-dependent problems, we usually have got quite good estimate from the previous time step. So that, that bit's not a worry. The, the, the headache is what do I do about getting this gradient for my system? And the Jacobi free is essentially saying, I don't need to calculate this gradient. This would be like a massive matrix system in practice. I just need to know that massive matrix system times uh, a vector x at each iteration for solving a linear problem. And so I can go back to almost the finite difference or the original definition of a derivative. And if I have an efficient implementation of the explicit operator, I can take a step multiplied by epsilon minus the explicit operator at the previous step and divided by epsilon. And that gives me that slope characteristic in the, the, the Jacobi iteration and the algorithm of choice or for many of us is to use GM res at this point. So that's, that's pretty much the building blocks in one slide, two PhDs, three years worth of effort. They had to get the code going, but that's pretty much what we did and tried to make it work. Uh, I was just gonna give you a few examples of that, but uh, I'll make a, uh, a few quick comments. So. One of the things I like about this Jacobi free operator is this uh, uh, Jacobian evaluation is just our explicit operation. So if we can make that run efficiently on an accelerated or a GPU architecture, we've also got for the simplicity scheme quite a nice access to get th those terms efficient. I haven't talked about the preconditioner. The preconditioner does tend to lead to matrix problems that we still have to solve. And another headache that you have to appreciate is there's a few more parameters to get around. We have to work out stopping criteria not uh, for our Jacobian free operator, for our Newton, our GM res, and for the preconditioning. So if you like, that's our headache that we still have to make it user-friendly is how do we set those parameters up more for the everyday user in an automatic manner. Does it work again? This is the example I showed you earlier on of a Reynolds number of 3,900, but solving with compressible flow in this case at a, at a low Mach number. Um, uh, and what do we see in terms of our speed up? If we did a, an explicit simulation here, we'd have to have a time step of one time 10 to the minus five, a little higher than my previous example with the Reynolds numbers much lower. If we look to the CFL number, it's actually quite small, 0 0.06. Really, the CFL number should be order, or could go up to order one. What that tells me in this case is it's probably dominated by the diffusion time step restriction, which is explicit. But in the DIRC, the diagonally implicit Runge cutter, that's what that stands for. This is the implicit scheme. We're able to get CFL conditions up to 40 based on the, the wave speed, or if it was just based on the, the convection velocity, a factor of three. And overall, each of these steps is much, much more expensive than explicit step. But that time step being three orders of magnitude bigger allows us to see a bay about a factor of 50. We can get between 10 and 20 typically times speed up by using this approach on, on their case. And I'm pretty happy with that. Um, if you've ever heard about people talk about GPUs and the speed ups, they always tell, or sometimes you hear you can have hundreds, but that's not a very fair comparison. Usually that's comparing one core to a whole GPU, and then you can have those factors. The one that I think has been more balanced is when I've seen comparison that if I have a, a modern CPU unit with as many processors on, and I buy a GPU unit for roughly the same cost, how much speed can I get from those two systems? 
And typically it seems you can get about five to 10 times speed up on the GPU system compared to the CPU. So that there is definitely speed up. But my point here is you can also achieve that level of speed up also if you play with the algorithms and get smarter algorithms. So those are the two tools we have to kind of advance those sort of areas. Ooh. So uh, more recently, we've been applying this in fully 3D. It is a, a project, an EU project called DGIN, where we're interested in doing jet acoustic simulation. So Daniel Lindblad has been our PhD student working with Chris Campbell. I'll show you the, uh, the ones I like the best. To getting the acoustics, I'm now realizing is quite a pain. But anyway, here, getting the jet characteristics, these are the uh, uh, comparison with experiments for polynomial two and three. This is the mean, and this is the RMS. What we see, we get the initial RMS, we don't get the core very well at this point, and this is actually proving a bit of a challenge about how we get good far field acoustic resolution from these simulations. But in this case, had we run this with uh, an explicit scheme, I think we're at least getting seven times speed up for, the, for this, this sort of algorithm. But we are running it on a tier zero supercomputer in, in Germany, so that I don't want to dispel the idea that there's not a computational cost involved here. Okay. So I've now broached on robustness and meshing, and the last topic was, okay, what about specialized boundary conditions? Why might I find those sort of useful? So here's a study that uh, I wanted to motivate. Okay, so this is to remind us of the scales that we might have commercially to run CFD. RANS is the most common industrial tool. Uh, within those commercial tools, they can also do something called detached eddy simulation. This is when you put unsteadiness in. So these, these tools, the, the, the discretizations, they're, they're perfectly fine. If you want to solve a RANS problem, a DES problem, I don't suggest using this technology. I think the tools that are there are more than fit for purpose, and that's the best thing you can do. If you want then to get it, the last few percentage accuracy out of your problem, then you've got to go and put some more physics into this case. So you've got these red and blue blobs represent turbulence near the wall, but in reality, they have a much finer structure. So we want to inject that information all over the place. We need a very big computer, or we also need to ask, can we reduce the domain size and afford to resolve that? So this is the technique we've been doing with a study uh, for external aerodynamics for lift and drag prediction. So in this case, you can use RANs quite well to predict the lift on an aerofoil. Uh, why does that work? Because RANs is able to capture the potential flow. So the pressure distribution over an aerofoil is pretty well captured, and that's what dictates the lift. That side's good. The problem is the uh, uh, drag prediction. Drag is not dominated, at least for an aerofoil or for wings, by the pressure. It's dominated by the shear stress. So it's the near wall turbulence on the wall that we, they really would like to extract to get good drag estimates. So what we can do is say, well, if I take my RAM simulation, can I take a smaller region and solve it in this, this embedded region in order to get back that, that boundary layer transition and turbulence in the near wave region? So that's the kind of process where the, the, if you're not familiar with this area, you inject a bit of noise. In reality, noise comes from the far field. It might hit some sort of bump on the surface. That's called a receptivity problem. And then it triggers something called uh, Tom and Schlicking or crossflow modes, which lead to boundary layer transition uh, uh, and then an increase in drag over the aeroflow. So why, why, why uh, uh, this, is, this is what the industry would like to have as a tool step. They start with their RAMs. We then do our embedded simulation, but in a moment I want to discuss this problem. We have how do we take appropriate boundary conditions on this outer surface, this interpolating these boundary conditions. Uh, if you then reconstruct the boundary layer, you can do local stability analysis, and it tells you lots of frequencies and wavelengths that might become unstable. Uh, and we can simulate that with little bumps to get a growth to how, how much the, these Tom and Schlichting waves grows. And then the industry use these envelopes of Tom and Schlichting growth, and they call it uh, N factors. They say, I have small perturbations, they're going to grow by an N factor, re roughly represents an order of magnitude a gr uh, increase in that growth. And if that magnitude gets up to six or seven, they assume it transitions to turbulence, and then they worry about having different shear stress models. So that's their total choice. And I'm worried about this interpolating these boundary conditions. 
So why should this go wrong? Um, I'm going to have to briefly hark back to something in this, this discontinuous Galerkin method that when we want information to travel between two cells in these methods, we solve a so-called Riemann problem. Riemann problems are very common in finite volume method and in these discontinuous Galerkin methods. And if the flow is subsonic, most civil aircraft uh, travel about a Mach number 0 0.8, 0 0.9, so in this, this subsonic but transonic type reg regime, it's a little tricky because two pieces of information travel in one direction and one piece of information travels in the opposite direction. And that's the key. So there's a coupling from inside the domain and outside the domain why we solve these Riemann problems. Now, if I was to take my embedded RAND simulation and just impose what would be a standard boundary condition for the method on this, on this outer boundary, which is the first naive step that we might do, why should that not be sufficient? Well, this is what happens. The black line represents the pressure distribution which has come from the RAND simulation, if we like the, the truth or we'd like to mimic. If we are naive about how we enforce that interpolation in this, this, through this Riemann problem, we get the red line pressure, pressure distribution. And it's not too bad in this case, but you can see it's not exactly conforming to the pressure that we'd like. Now, I argued to begin with, to get the right lift, we want, we think the pressure is good. So this is the quantity we want to maintain when we do the inner simulation. So how can we go back and recover the right pressure distribution to be able to do these smaller embedded simulations? So there are various choices we can make. I told you this red and this green line are two pieces of incoming information. I could choose, I'd like to choose to impose the momentum and the pressure. I could choose the momentum or the velocity, or there's this rather abstract quantity of entropy we have in the flow, and you can impose that. Now, uh, we start by trying to do the first one, but then we find not all solutions are good. If we choose momentum, the, the solution blows up. So I want to motivate what solutions are good in the first step, and there's a second step I would just uh, comment on at the end that we also have to do something to control a few wiggles on top of that. So. Like with the stability analysis I showed you for the uh, uh, robustness and stabilization, we can go back to our 1D problems, reduce it to as a small uh, uh, problem as we like, and analyze, if you like, the eigensystem of that and see what it tells us. And if we go and do that, we would take a 1D segment, we take a linear approximation of the elements, and we impose different boundary conditions coming in versus going out. Okay, you eventually will end up with an ordinary differential equation and this time we're going to look for the eigenvalues of this C matrix, which we don't have time to explain here. But what we learn from that is we shouldn't impose momentum or pressure. The eigenvalues of the system are unstable, so, so small perturbations just grow and the solution blows up. If we always keep the entropy, the, the, the key take home message here in this, this recent paper is entropy plus anything else is imposable. And then we can have any quantities we want. In our case, we wanted to maintain pressure but you could uh, maintain, you could have one of the invariants, the real invariants or enthalpy, that's all perfectly valid. Uh, another variant could have been velocity density, but that's also unstable. So that's what Ganlin uh, Lee looked at in this paper. And now we found we can match the pressure perfectly on the outside. There was a little caveat that in the flow, when it's in the stagnation region, when it comes to the front of the aerofoil in this case, it, was, it becomes neutrally stable, this boundary condition. This is a little headache because then any wiggles that get in numerically don't go away. They just stay in there. So we have to be a bit more careful about the stagnation flow in this case. Okay, so that was more or less it for those cases. Uh, there is a little caveat. There's never a perfect solution. If I go and do that, I got my right pressure distribution. In this case, because I put an artificial boundary and I've got acoustic waves, what do they do when they hit the outer boundary? They reflect back in the domain and bounce around, which is not what we would like. So we can control it by putting sponge regions. And uh, so there's, there's a, not complete free lunches in any of these things. I have a smaller domain. I can do a more accurate simulation. But as I've shown you, you've got to play or be careful with the boundary conditions, how you control and stabilize the flows. So that was kind of the end of my little cycle. I just had two other slides. So, so I'm saying we're going from academia to industry. So are we actually doing anything with industry? So a little exercise we've been doing with Rolls-Royce over the last few years is to ask, can, what is the technical readiness level of our tools for them? So I don't know if it's a NASA concept, TRL, so if you're familiar with this ter terminology, it's where they assign this number for maturity uh, and it has a region of nine. It goes from one, uh, which was to say basic principles, up to nine, which is uh, system deployment. And, and what usually happens, we work here in academia from one to three or four, 
an industry where we're only thinking from six to nine, and then we have a little gap in the middle that nobody wants to play in. So in a way, the reason for collaborating with them and McLaren is, okay, what do we do about this gap? So what we have been able to do, the compressible flow solver I showed you, they've now rated through their internal exercise of running cases up to TRNL4, which is still on the academic boundary. But the first solver I showed you, uh, we now have up to a TRL of six with them. And what, uh, why was that possible? Well, for the, these blade simulations, these are uh, a low pressure turbine blades where we run them more to run us on 100, 300,000. They have a case that they do experiments on these blades and they often put a ray of cylinders, which is what we see in front, so which is, represents the uh, rotor part uh, approaching a stator. And we got a pretty good comparison. The, the, let me see, I think the, uh, experiments with the dots in these, these are weight profiles afterwards, by very accurate refinement of these simulations and capturing the right flow physics and having the inflow noise. So that's what's built confidence with them that the tools can reproduce their experimental situation. And we have a couple of people, so that's at least been rated by them internally, and now we have at least a couple of people deploying that, if you like, on the more research side, and that's for us to try and springboard that up a bit further. So that's also what we've now got to go through the exercise of the compressible flow. So in this case, they have another stage of the engine referred to as high pressure turbines. We've done uh, preliminary experiments of what I would consider crazy Reynolds number, but the stabilization is okay. We don't resolve everything there. And we're going through this exercise of trying to compare with experiments. But here we have shocks, uh, which we also have to stabilize. So we don't have Rolls-Royce internally using that yet, even if they classified it, but some of their centers, uh, the, the university technology centers we've been discussing with, both at Imperial and other universities, uh, and, and also a, a bit of interactions with Leon and Safra. So that's pretty much it for me. Hopefully after we started later, at least we finished broadly on time, what are it? So kind of motivated by these industrial flow challenges, uh, I have noticed from my last decade of my life, there's this continual cycle of going to meshing, solve those problems, understanding how we stabilize our flows, understanding how we make something either more efficient or come up with a reduced simulation technique that's useful to, to a given industry so they can find the tools. And, and then it starts again, it doesn't go away. And more recently, I, I generally shied away from implicit techniques. The explicit techniques historically were complicated enough, but now I've been won over by, in order to get to these uh, industrial strength simulations, we're having to look at that much, much more closely. And we're also looking at implicit algorithms for incompressible flows. And the last take home message I hope I've got through, even if we didn't understand the details, but 1D analysis of representative problems have been very insightful to how we build up the solutions for these more complicated problems. That's what came out of the stabilization and these boundary conditions uh, and used in the right manner. There's a lot of power to be extracted from there. So that's, that's certainly what we uh, advocate for when we come up to our next problem that we come across. Okay, thank you for your attention. We have time for questions? Yeah? Um, Is anyone out there? <laughs> I can ask a question. Okay, so regarding the uh, the um, specialized condition, so your run simulation is a steady state run simulation. Okay, so uh, let's suppose that you want to do an unsteady run simulation. Have you thought about the two-way coupling? How the because I guess you're not doing the yeah, we're not doing uh, that. Like. The back, yeah. I think that, so. The, the guess out course for us is if we make that embedded domain, domain wide enough, then the displacement of the boundary layer would be a small proportion of where it's influenced. So the the effect would be you'd have a thickening of the boundary layer, and that does indeed affect the potential flow. Mm -hmm. But if hopefully if we can take it to a reasonable distance out, then then that coupling may not be too strong. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we're extracting is the pressure field too. So the pressure field is also quite constant over boundary layers. So again, that may not be deformed so much. So so I don't think I'm hoping it's not a problem for this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you could couple it back, but the cost of the inner simulation is probably way beyond the RANS, which might be good. You could just, every processor could be running a RANS simulation mm -hmm. that you fed back in and then it updates it. So I suppose that, that would be possible in principle. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and what about, okay, so another question related to the specialized boundary conditions. So you mentioned that uh, uh, those boundary conditions related 
when you put the entropy as one of the variables, are they stable ones, right? So, yeah. for example, when you put like entropy and pressure, it should be okay, yeah. right? But uh, do you also have to specify the direction of the flow? How do you solve for that? So you'd like we'd like to specify that, and we're allowing that to be weakly imposed. Now, when you solve this problem, we're just solving a one D problem of the boundary normal to the boundary. Okay. So so we're 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 not specifying that the tangent condition is allowed to be it, it, it is matched if you like. Mm -hmm. So that bit of the velocity is fine. Just the the wall normal is adjusted. Okay, I see. I see. So, so there is some enforcement that's still going on. Okay, I see. So. No? <laughs> well, when we finish our next cycle of yeah. cell modeling, then we get to that bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Stensick. Thank you, Professor Bruno Chang. And once. Thank you, everyone on YouTube. And see you on next colloquium, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.